Hello, my name is Dick Gratz. I'm a tire wheel service engineer with the General Motors Proving Ground in Milford, Michigan. Here in the tire lab, we study tire wear, alignment, and vibration conditions. Our objective is to provide cars and trucks for our customers that offer the best possible tire and wheel performance. Since 1984, almost all Buick models have come equipped with all-season radial tires as standard equipment. Because of their design, all-season tires provide exceptional traction in wet, dry, and snowy conditions, while still providing quiet operation, low rolling resistance, and excellent wear characteristics. In fact, most all-season radials can be expected to last at least as long as the highway tread designs they replaced. But if an all-season radial is subjected to abuse, it may wear in patterns unlike those normally associated with highway treads. To better understand why this happens, it's important to understand a little about tire tread design in general. On a tire with a typical highway tread design, the tread pattern is laid out in five obvious rows. Some of the rows are separated by only small, shallow cross grooves, while other rows are separated by larger cross grooves. When the tread row is separated by large cross grooves, the row is actually divided into sections of rubber commonly referred to as tread blocks. It's the combination of randomly placing tread blocks between the numerous cross grooves that separates all season tires from highway tires. You see, with the tread blocks divided by numerous random cross grooves, the all season tires gain superior all weather traction. It's also because of these random cross grooves that all season tires are more likely to wear differently than tires with highway treads. Since the numerous random cross grooves divide the tread into numerous individual blocks of rubber, the blocks have less structural support when compared with a highway tread. Under normal circumstances, this isn't a problem. As the tire rotates, the tread blocks remain relatively stationary. But when a car corners frequently, or the toe is incorrect, the tire tread is subjected to a great deal of lateral force, which causes the tread blocks to twist and squirm in an unusual manner. It's the twisting, squirming action of the tread blocks that causes all season tires to wear in patterns commonly referred to as irregular. An added characteristic of irregular wear is that it's usually isolated to the non-driven tires of both front and rear wheel drive models you normally don't find irregular wear on the driven tires because they have a tendency to wear in more uniform patterns. But the non-driven wheels are often subjected to the exact lateral forces which contribute to the three different irregular wear patterns. The first of these is characterized by the stepped wear pattern it leaves in the individual tread blocks of the tire. This wear is referred to as heel and toe wear and often causes increased tire noise. The easiest way to identify this pattern is to rub your hand from the front of the tire towards the rear of the tire. If you feel a sawtoothed roughness or step pattern in the tread, the tire has heel and toe wear. It's normal for all season radials to experience minor heel and toe wear near the outside shoulders of the tire. This is particularly true when the tires are on the front wheels of a rear wheel drive model or the tires are new and the tread depth is deepest and most likely to squirm. To eliminate this wear, check that the tire pressure is equal to the specifications listed on the driver's door edge placard and simply rotate the tires. All of our tire suppliers recommend the modified X method of tire rotation, which calls for the tires from one side of the car to be X to the other side of the car. This method eventually puts each tire on all four corners of the car. This allows each tire to rotate in both directions and to operate on both the drive axle and the non-drive axle. This combination will best minimize irregular tire wear. If heel and toe wear continues unchecked, it can eventually wear into a more advanced and extreme pattern known as diagonal wear.
This wear is characterized by the diagonal patterns that actually wear across the tire tread. When tires reach this state, they can't be salvaged by rotation and must be replaced. A third type of irregular tire wear is similar to diagonal wear and is commonly called cupping. Cupping appears as a somewhat diagonal pattern towards the edge of the tread. The big difference between cupping and diagonal wear is the width of the wear pattern. Diagonal wear patterns run across the entire width of the tread, while cupping patterns remain on one side. Usually, cupping is found on rear wheel drive cars that corner frequently. If a car has a chronic case of irregular tire wear, it's a good idea to check the rotation history of the tires. If they haven't been properly rotated at the scheduled intervals, there's a good possibility that's the cause. If they have been rotated, chances are the toe angles on the non-driven wheels are incorrect. Excessive toe angles on non-driven wheels cause irregular tire wear. Excessive toe angles on driven wheels cause regular but premature tire wear. One common misconception about irregular tire wear is that it's caused by wheel imbalance, wheel runout, or faulty shock absorbers. That's just not true. Besides road conditions and driving conditions, the three service areas that can cause irregular wear are improper inflation pressure, lack of rotation using the modified X method, and misalignment, specifically toe. Because proper alignments are such an important part of keeping irregular tire wear to a minimum, it's vital that four-wheel alignments are done properly. To assure good alignments, the proper pre-alignment checks must be performed. To begin with, the alignment equipment itself must be in good working order. Check alignment rack turn plates and slider plates at least on a monthly basis. They should travel freely without binding or sticking. Some alignment rack manufacturers suggest frequent turn plate lubrication, while others discourage it. Check the manufacturer's recommendations for your particular rack. Some equipment maintenance procedures, such as rack levelness and alignment head calibration, are normally performed by alignment equipment professionals. These checks should be performed twice a year, or more frequently if needed. Remember. The accuracy of your alignment depends on the accuracy of the equipment you use. Equally important to equipment checks is getting the car ready for the alignment. Begin by making sure the trunk is free of heavy objects. Aligning a car with excess weight in the trunk can result in false alignment readings. Next, slide the seat or seats to the full rear position. Give the inside of the car a quick once over to make sure there's nothing heavy in the interior. And look at the fuel gauge. Buick alignment specifications assume the fuel tank is full. If the tank isn't full, either fill the tank or simulate a full tank by adding six pounds of weight for each estimated gallon that's missing. Now that the car has the front seat properly positioned, excess weight removed, and the equivalent of a full tank of fuel, the suspension is ready for inspection. Loose suspension parts can alter an alignment every time the car hits a bump. By inspecting suspension components before the alignment, worn parts can be spotted before a needless alignment is performed. Section 3 of the service manual highlights checks for many important front and rear suspension components. The final pre-alignment inspection is for proper vehicle trim height. Buick alignment specifications are designed with the car resting above a minimum trim height specification. The know-how reference manual explains exactly how to check the trim height and includes the latest trim height specifications. Once the preliminary checks are complete, attach the alignment heads and perform the four-wheel alignment. Remember, Always align the rear wheels first so that they can be used as an accurate reference when aligning the front wheels. If you don't, the car's thrust line may be incorrect. The car's thrust line 
is an imaginary line established by the toe angles of the two rear wheels. Ideally, the rear wheels should track directly behind the front wheels when the car is moving straight forward. When this happens, the thrust line points in the same direction as the vehicle center line. If the rear wheels don't follow directly behind the front wheels, the thrust line points in a different direction than the center line of the car. This can happen if only one of the wheels is towed inward or outward, or if the entire rear axle is offset. In either case, the thrust line deviates from the vehicle center line, and the front wheels must compensate for the car to travel in a straight path. This is commonly recognized as dog tracking and results in several problems. First, the steering wheel does not rest in a centered position. The car understeers when turning in one direction, oversteers when turning in the opposite direction, and since the toe is off, promotes irregular tire wear. Similar to a misaligned thrust angle is a misaligned cradle on a front wheel drive car. This typically happens if the car has a minor collision or hits a big pothole. The first clue to a misaligned cradle is a caster difference from side to side of more than one degree. If you suspect the cradle is out of alignment, place a set of guide pins in the gauge holes of the cradle. If both guide pins fit in the gauge holes, the cradle is aligned properly and should not be adjusted. If one or both of the guide pins doesn't go into the gauge holes, loosen the cradle bolts just enough to allow cradle movement and maneuver the cradle back into its proper position. If the cradle still doesn't align, it's possible the cradle or body may be misaligned due to damage. Once it's positioned, it's very important to torque the cradle bolts in the proper sequence. This secures the cradle with even loads and reduces the possibility of future misalignment. One area that's seen a lot of improvement in the last few years is the rolling smoothness of our tire wheel assemblies. With the development of radial tires, improvements in tire and wheel manufacturing techniques and better balancing equipment, vibration complaints are down. Nonetheless, a lot of older cars are still on the road and even some of the new ones may still experience a tire wheel vibration complaint. Most vibration complaints result from imbalances in the tire, wheel, or wheel cover. The most common imbalance is a single plane static imbalance. This imbalance results from a heavy spot which affects the tire along a single plane. Because of the heavy spot, the tire attempts to move in an unwanted up and down direction. This up and down motion creates vibrations that are eventually felt by the driver and passengers. The other type of tire and wheel imbalance is called two-plane dynamic imbalance. This imbalance is called two-plane because the tire has a heavy spot that sits along one plane but tries to move to another plane when the tire spins. Since the weight can't go where inertia is forcing it, the wheel and tire vibrate. The most common method of solving both single plane and two plane imbalance is with a computer balancer. An important part of accurate computer balancing is the way the wheel is mounted on the machine. In almost all cases, the appropriate mounting cone is placed against the back of the wheel and the wheel is mounted so that the front side of the wheel faces outward. Most computer balancers have three adjustable settings, wheel width, wheel diameter, and wheel distance from the balancer. Typically, these adjustments are very easy to make and don't take much time, but it's important to remember that inaccurate or careless measurements affect the accuracy of the balancer. And as you probably know, balancing a tire and wheel assembly with the wrong settings can actually create an imbalance condition. The know-how reference manual explains the instance when back coning is not recommended. One final note on computer balancers relates to calibration. As with the alignment rack, computer balancers must be calibrated to provide accurate readings. The simplest way of checking a balancer is to balance two tire and wheel assemblies. This should be done at a time when the balancer is known to be accurate. Balance one assembly to zero, the other to an imbalanced state, and then mount the assemblies on the balancer at least once every month 
to see if it agrees with the original balance. If the balancer agrees with what's written on the tires, it's still in calibration. If it doesn't agree, you know the balancer needs calibration. On-car balancers are often successful in finish balancing problem tire and wheel assemblies. The benefit of an on-car balancer is its ability to recognize imbalances created by brake parts and in some cases, wheel covers. However, this benefit is lost when tires and wheels are rotated without rebalancing. When using the on-car balancer on the front wheels of a front wheel drive car, it's very important to support the suspension so the drive axles are kept at normal driving angles. If the CV joints are driven at extreme angles, they can be damaged. Also important is the speed at which self-driven wheels are rotated. When the car is off the ground, the wheel spins at twice the speed of what the speedometer indicates. This means that when the speedometer reads 30 miles per hour, the wheel speed is actually 60 miles per hour, which is ideal for balancing. When you perform the on-car balance after an off-car balance, it's important to leave the weights from the off-car balance in place. Simply add more weights as needed for the on-car balance. Occasionally, a tire and wheel assembly produces vibrations even when it's properly balanced. When this happens, it's time to dig a little deeper and check the runout of the tire and wheel. This wheel is set up for a lateral runout check. The check can be made with the tire on the wheel or off, and the wheel either on the car or on a balancer like this. To make this check, mount the dial indicator so it contacts the side of the bead seat. Rotate the wheel to find the point of lowest needle deflection and zero the needle. Next. Rotate the wheel one complete revolution and watch the needle for maximum deflection. Disregard any momentary needle jumps caused by paint chips, welds, or dirt, and compare the runout measurement to specifications. To ensure a thorough inspection, measure both sides of the wheel. If the wheel's lateral runout is out of specifications, replace it. But if it's within specifications, move on to the radial runout check. To make this check, simply mount the dial indicator so it rests against the inside of the wheel. Again, zero the indicator, rotate the wheel one revolution, and compare the reading to the specifications. Next, repeat the measurement on the other side of the wheel. If the radial runout is out of specifications, replace the wheel. If the radial runout is within specifications and there's still a vibration, Check the tire and wheel for combined runout. Checking combined runout helps determine if the tire itself has excessive radial runout. This is done essentially the same as checking radial runout on the wheel alone, only this time the dial indicator follows a strip of tape wrapped around the tread. It's important to understand, though, the combined radial runout measurements are not as accurate as the wheel runout measurements alone. It's possible for a tire to measure within specifications and still cause a vibration condition. The problem here is that the tire runout can drastically change when the tire is loaded. To get around this, equipment is available that's designed to measure the combined wheel and tire runout in a loaded state. If the tire does have a high spot when it's loaded, the machine is capable of buffing away excess rubber so the tire rolls true when it's loaded. If this type of machine isn't available at your dealership, you can often match the highest spot of the tire with the lowest spot of the wheel to achieve a smooth rolling assembly. This is called match mounting. On most cars, match mounting is done when the tires and wheels are first assembled. The bright paint spot or sticker represents the tire high spot, and the valve stem represents the wheel low spot. You'll notice that new Regals don't have the high point mark aligned with the valve stem in the wheel. This is simply because more accurate tire and wheel manufacturing techniques have made match mounting unnecessary on the Regals. Eventually, advancements in tire and wheel development will make factory match mounting a thing of the past on all Buicks. Even as this program is being released, continued testing is being done to provide even longer wearing 
better gripping, smoother rolling tires. In fact, you should already be seeing some new tread designs on certain new models. This, coupled with what you've learned today in this program, should provide your customers with tire performance that is the best in the industry. The